Hello everyone, welcome to Azure On Air. In today's episode, we will be talking about infra and app modernization efforts with Thomas Van Lare. Thomas is a certified Microsoft Azure consultant from Belgium who helps business and organizations with building strategies that result in lower capital and operating expenditures by utilizing the Microsoft Azure platform and open source technologies. So uh, I'm very happy to invite this uh, extremely talented person, Thomas, to our show. Yeah, so the the main driving points for um, for doing an, a migration or uh, an app modernization uh, to Azure, um, you know, there's there's uh, a lot of different triggers for uh, a lot of different companies, right? So no, there's um, a lot of people might think that there's only technical requirements when you're dealing with this type of uh, effort. What I typically see um, here is that a lot of ISVs are, are moving to the cloud, right? Mm. They, they typically these these customers that I've worked with, they they had their on-premises environment and it worked very well for them. Um, but um, yeah, I think investing in, in training um, and, and learning how the platform works is uh, is very crucial to making this sort of thing work uh, after the fact. Hey, I'm Rita. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are. The pleasure is on our side, Thomas. We are we are really excited to have you on our show, and the topic mm-hmm. itself sounds very interesting for us. When I reached out for the topic to you, you just gave me a uh, infra and op, app modernization is what I'm dealing with. So uh, we are very curious to know what is infra and uh, app modernization is. Yeah. So uh, infra and app modernization um, is basically. You know, when a business uh, thinks to itself, we have this application that's um, generating a lot of revenue for us, it's generating a lot of income, let's say, um, but we want to make it even better, or maybe they see that their application has some deficiencies or uh, points that they can prove upon, and um, they're thinking to themselves, hey, maybe we should use the Azure Cloud to, um, you know, modernize um certain parts of the infrastructure or the application. Mm. Um, and in doing so, you know, make the, let's say, the end result for the end user even better. So, Yeah. So yeah. Uh, as a consultant, uh, can you just give us a uh, point on uh, when people uh, go ahead with infra and app modernization, uh, what would be the impact on their business? Yeah. So the the main driving points for um, for doing an, a migration or uh, an, an app modernization mm. uh, to Azure, um, you know, there's there's uh, a lot of different triggers for uh, a lot of different companies, right? So no no journey to the cloud is the same. Um, mm. There can be there can be many different uh, triggers. So for instance. Um, Let's take you know with the COVID uh, pandemic for example, you've had you've had a lot of companies that um, had to almost overnight uh, switch to a remote uh, working kind of you know setup for their for their uh, colleagues, um, and, and and that sort of thing where you need additional you know compute power um, on demand um, is is one of the the main you know driving forces. Um, to um, to start a migration to Azure, um, that's at least what what I've seen. Um, but there can also be lots of other motivators, right? You can you can all of a sudden maybe need to deal with uh, additional regulatory compliances, right? Um, mm. um, maybe maybe you're in the healthcare sector, and all of a sudden, since you have to make advantage, uh, use the, the Azure platform, you have to take stuff like uh, data sovereignty into consideration. Um, so maybe maybe you can set up a model where you have like um, your, your data still hosted in your on-premises data center, um, for instance, in Belgium, and you can um, maybe run all of the compute resources and do all the calculations in Azure in like a West Europe or France region. Um, or, or, you know, there can be um, a lot of other motivators, uh, as well, like, um, latency, uh, performance, that sort of thing. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different triggers, um, many, many different triggers on why you might want to do this. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. also I would like to know what are the prerequisites for, required for this migration and app modernization? Um, well, it's not just technical, right? Mm. There's um, a lot of people might think that there's only technical requirements when you're dealing with this type of uh, effort. Um, but there, there's actually a whole social aspect of it as well, right? Um, doing uh, one of these migrations or modernizing your application is, a, is something where you really want to make sure that you have all the stakeholders there to talk about what it is that you want to do and uh, what the end result should be. Um, so what uh, my colleagues and I, because you never do a migration or um, app modernization by yourself, mm. what my colleagues and I have um, discovered is that if you put everyone in the same room and try to get everyone on the same page, um, that, that really helps um, when, you're, when you're dealing with this type of work. Mm. And also adopting an, an agile mindset, let's say, um, can really help when you're, when you're dealing with these types of efforts. Um, you know, because um, nothing is ever set in stone with these types of things, right? You might have like a meeting and all of a sudden the meeting stops and uh, you're sitting at home and all of a sudden you have this great idea um, and then you tell it to your colleagues the next day and they're all, they're all you know, enthusiastic about it maybe. Mm. And then you have to really uh, quickly, um, you know, um, maybe adopt um, certain different ways of working. Uh, and, and, and for that to be successful, you, you really have to, you know, adopt the agile mindset that really, really helps. Yeah. So that's, that's completely, uh, I, I, I agree to it, uh, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, yeah, I would also, uh, like to know, um, uh, because I think you've been here for a long time. So mm -hmm. what would be the, I, I would like to know your experience with this, uh, your clients regarding this app modernization. So uh, yeah. how has it been and what were the pros and cons and challenges that you faced so that we can also get to know how it went through what the process is? Yeah, yeah, uh, certainly. Well, um, you know, I, I think we can split this this question up into, into where we can divide these clients into three different categories, right? Mm. You have the clients that really just want to do the infrastructure um, migration to Azure. Or you have the customers that, that want to um, modernize their apps through the use of Kubernetes, for instance, or via other container um, technologies. Mm -hmm. And then there's the ones that want to use more Azure native um, things. Like they're, they're really the ones that say, look, we really, really, really don't want to deal with uh, updating VMs and any of that. Uh, we just want it to be taken care of for us. Um, and we only want to use like um, Azure web apps or app services um, mm -hmm. and function apps, that sort of thing. So they really just want to use uh, platform as a service offerings and serverless offerings. Um, so um, yeah, those are the three types of, of clients that I typically meet mm -hmm. um, the last few years uh, due to COVID mainly. Uh, I've seen a lot of customers that just wanted to um, move their infrastructure to Azure uh, as quickly as possible. Um, like for instance, the, some of the main drivers there were that one of the, the clients that I had, um, their contract with their service provider was running out and they started to, you know, compare um, at a really low level, just comparing, you know, machines, uh, the, the total amount of machines, they would enter them in the Azure calculator and maybe have a look at what it would cost them uh, monthly, and then they would see that it's actually a whole lot cheaper, especially if you mm -hmm. factor in things like hybrid use benefit and reserved instances and all that stuff, so that you can, you know, get some additional savings on your compute and licenses. Um, yeah, those were really the main drivers. And then they would uh, come up to us and uh, ask us if we could do the migration for them. Mm. And uh, then you, you know, typically use tools like Azure, uh, Azure Migrate and, um, and uh, a lot of PowerShell uh, <laughs> to, to get that migration done. Mm. Uh, because automation, that's, that's one of the, the things that, that I um, typically say in a lot of my presentations is that automation is 
is key to when it comes to migrating a whole lot of yeah. servers. Um, like for, for one uh, ISV, I think we did about um, 500 or so VMs, I oh. think is what we did. Um, yeah, we you, you have to think about this this way, right? So this ISV had like a ton of different customers and all mm. those customers had different um, you know, different amount of VMs mm. and they wanted to move them all to Azure. And uh, we did that. And, um, you know, that's where, again, Azure Migrate really helps a lot. Azure Lighthouse, uh, so you can target different subscriptions. So you have that separation of concerns. So each customer has their own tenant, let's say. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and a lot of PowerShell, like uh, a lot of PowerShell and Ansible as well. It's uh, all these tools that help uh, with uh, automating um, otherwise uh, manual processes, let's say. Um, those are really a godsend when you have um, when, when you when you're dealing with these types of migrations. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that's quite uh, nice to hear about the experience mm -hmm. that you had with the uh, clients that you mentioned, like literally 500 yeah. VMs. Obviously, automation is much required thing at that point in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, uh, what sort of domains are kindly uh, undertaking this migration or modernization? What uh, sort of domains are con currently moving towards this uh, modernization effort? Yeah. So I can only speak for the, the clients that I did here in Belgium, right? Ah, uh, sure. And also the, the Netherlands. Um, but what, what I typically see um, here is that a lot of ISVs are, are moving to the cloud, right? Mm. They, they typically these... These customers that I've worked with, they they had their on-premises environment and it worked very well for them. Uh, it, it generated lots of revenue, so that's a good thing. And uh, at a certain point, they just want to optimize, right? Or maybe they want to start taking advantage of some some of those, um, you know, highly available features that the Azure cloud has. Um, and they just can't do that on their own data center because it's perhaps physically not possible. Maybe they don't have the the infrastructure there or, or um, you know, um, the time to invest um, uh, training uh, for, their, for their employees in order to make that sort of high available setup work in their on-premises data center. Mm. So then something like Azure, which is, um, I, I think is, you know, low entry, let's say, um, anyone can get started with it, um, especially if you Take a look at something like Microsoft Learn or something to, you know, to bootstrap your your process or your, to get your feet wet into Azure. That that really helps. Um, but you know, um, once they sort of transition there, uh, they can immediately start to take advantage of uh, of those uh, added values uh, that the Azure Cloud offers. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's nice to hear. Uh... Thomas, I would also like to have a quick tip from the expert yourself about yep. what are the uh, uh, requirements or uh, what should we be aware when we, when we are planning for an uh, modernization. So how, how prepared should uh, an end user be when he's preparing for a migration? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, it's... Uh... You, you really have to take into consideration that it's not just um, the technical aspect of it all. It's also the, 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 the people aspect, the social aspect, right? Mm. Um, like um, when, you're, when you're doing this, 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 these types of, let's say, infrastructure migrations, uh, again, um, it's, it's not just setting up Azure Migrate. It's not just setting up the landing zones in Azure. Mm. Um, but it's also, you know, how am I going to... How am I going to ensure that once we're alive in, in this new environment, mm. how am I going to make sure that the people, the operations people or the, the development people, that they, that they know how the platform works, right? Because it's mm. maybe an entirely new platform and they might have to learn additional skills in order to maybe bridge a skill gap. Right. That is something that companies really have to take into consideration. And I don't, often see them uh, invest in this sort of thing enough. But again, it's up to the, the client to decide whether or not this is necessary. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I think investing in, in training um, and, and learning how the platform works is, uh, is very crucial 
to making this sort of thing work uh, after the fact. Mm. Um, but also, you know, to, I'm just thinking about um, before the migration, um, having a partner or a, a consultant as myself um, <laughs> uh, help you. Uh, I think that or someone that has a lot of experience uh, with the platform itself. Um, uh, that can give you a lot of different perspectives as well. And, um, and there's also the, um, the cloud adoption framework, uh, for instance, uh, is a set of best practices, if you will, mm. uh, from, from Microsoft, right? It's uh, written specifically for, for those customers who are at that part of their journey, who are thinking to themselves, look, we have this opportunity to move to the, the Microsoft cloud, the Azure cloud, how are we going to make this happen and how are we going to make it happen uh, in a correct manner, right? Mm. Because everyone wants to do it um, correct from the start. Yeah. Um, but that's typically not how it works. Again, you have to adopt the, the agile mindset because you're, you're going to have to incrementally improve upon what it is you're building. Mm. Um, but the cloud adoption framework can help you, you know, get a, get a decent head start. Uh, there's also um, an assessment tool in there, for instance. That can help you, um, you know, um, take a look at some some gaps that you might have missed when you're performing your initial analysis of, of things that you want to to move to to the cloud and maybe modernize and maybe um, optimize, um, and so that you have a, a full picture of, mm. of what it is you're doing, right? From from a security standpoint or a business standpoint, like what is this going to cost me if I'm going to, for instance pick a certain VM SKU, um, what is, what is the, the end result going to be like? That mm. sort of thing. So that's, there's, a, there's a lot of tools out there um, that can help. And uh, Cloud Adoption Framework is, is really one of them. Super. Yeah, yeah. I, there's, this seems to be a wide topic when we speak about it. Yeah, 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 it is. Keep digging yeah. and digging and it gets into a very wide topic, yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, as a consultant who are planning for an or assisting people to uh, with infra and app modernization efforts, your clear motto is to move customers that to into using containers, serverless, or other native solutions, yeah? As your native yep, services. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yep. So uh, yep. we also know about your blog post which often talks mm -hmm. about container technologies and its inner workings yep. would you like to yep. throw a light on those container technologies sure thing um yeah there's um you know when, when microsoft i think it was in in 2016 that they announced their partnership with with docker i was immediately intrigued because i absolutely had no idea what they just announced I was sitting sitting there thinking, I don't even know what this is, but I'm thinking that this might be the next big thing. Mm. And I think I was I was partially right. Um, I, I saw a lot of um, a lot of developers, um, you know, from the .NET side, show a lot of interest in this thing, and especially when you know a .NET Core came about, um, containerizing applications so that they would run on you know Linux containers. Uh, seemed like a given at that point, but I wanted to know how uh, mm. how they worked internally. So I wrote a lot of blog posts. Um, you know, I I, um, I wrote a lot of blog posts that mm. went into detail on on how these work um, behind the scenes, right? Without without Docker, let's say, how containers work on on mm. Linux uh, and on Windows. Um, yeah, so I, I I did a lot of research on that. I'm really glad that I did it because now I have a pretty solid understanding of what is going on behind the scenes so what a kubernetes is doing for you and how much of the heavy lifting it's doing so it's it's uh, all in all it's pretty impressive because there's there's a lot of things that you can tweak behind the scenes and it's good that there's something like docker or podman or kubernetes that's uh, that's yeah. uh, taking care of this but um perhaps um related to the you know migration efforts there's there's now it's uh 2022 now I've uh, I've had a lot of customers uh, ask about how they should containerize their applications and how they should set up their uh, um, Kubernetes environments uh, especially on Azure um, and again it's a it's an ecosystem that is moving very rapidly still so you might have like a, a set of best practices implemented in place right now 
but that could very rapidly shift to you know another set of best practices or, or newer best practices um yeah so so it's still very much uh, in flux let's say mm. but it's uh, i i would say that it's stabilizing now somewhat uh, i think there's a lot of open source tools out there now that that um are sort of let's say winning the battle they're becoming mm. the standard uh things like open policy agent i think is a, a very cool one like when you want to enforce a specific set of, uh, of policies mm. um on your on your containers right if you want them to run only from containers from a specific uh registry for instance or or, or that sort of thing um yeah. so it's it's very very useful um but um, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of customers now take advantage of, uh, of Kubernetes and especially on Azure uh, with uh, Azure Kubernetes service. Mm. Um, I don't typically see a lot of customers hosting their own Kubernetes setup. So just, you know, that they host the master and the worker nodes themselves um, because it's, it's, it's much easier to, to leave the, the heavy lifting and all the... the um, you know, the yeah. best the, the best efforts that that the best efforts from Microsoft are in place on those master nodes because those are very critical, right? Mm. And um, just let Microsoft take care of the the master nodes, and so that you can focus on the the worker nodes. Um, but again, that's um, that's also you know uh, the ma the worker nodes are also uh, covered in part by Microsoft, so it's. So um, it, there's a bit of a shared responsibility going on there, mm. which is uh, really neat, I'd say. Yeah. So uh, when we had our uh, initial conversation about recording this podcast, uh, I just mm -hmm. got to know that every now and then that you take a detour into Azure Confidential Computing and Azure Care Studio. So um, yeah, that's right. yeah uh, I think that would sound interesting if you give us some uh, uh, a quick talk about it because the audience would be much interested in knowing about it. Okay, so yeah, uh, Azure Confidential Computing. Um, um, this uh, I think is a really interesting subject because you know the in, back in twenty twenty, I think mm. um, I, I I think it was at Ignite or Microsoft Microsoft Build um, mm. that I learned about this. It, there there wasn't I think there was like a small announcement on confidential computing, but not a lot more, um, and and then I decided to dive into it because again I didn't know what it was and I wanted to know, so um, I just jumped in and um, I, I went down the rabbit hole, let's say, um, because um, it, it's it's quite uh, a, a complex subject, um, but I think you know that the 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 thing with confidential computing is that the um, like uh, the guys over at Microsoft would argue that, you know, you have you have three types of um, of security, right? You have mm. uh, security at rest, which is on data that is just sitting in storage. Uh, you have encryption in transit, which is like mm -hmm. um, um, HTTPS and that sort of uh, network level encryption. And then they would argue that there is also a third form of encryption that we're not utilizing as much as we should be, mm. which is encryption uh, as data is being processed. And this is, um, I thought that was very interesting. I thought, hey, yeah, you might be right. But, um, you know, I thought that there were many different sort of security mechanisms in place that made it so that um, data that's in progress, that it is actually safe. But um, I guess things could be safer, right? So uh, it can't ever be safe enough. So then um, they, um, the, the, the people over at Microsoft, you know, they said, look, we have this, this offering called Confidential Compute, mm -hmm. and it takes, uh, takes advantage of this special, um, you know, these special instructions on specific Intel CPUs, because this only works on Intel CPUs. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, if you think that that you never had to deal with uh, uh, vendor specific CPUs again, you'd be wrong. You still have to deal with them when you're looking at uh, confidential computing. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a very interesting topic. Um, there's a 
when I reviewed it, there were there was a library or a, uh, a runtime or a framework, let's say, um, called uh, Open Enclave, uh, which was backed by Microsoft, which still is backed by Microsoft, um, and it's actually a C and C plus plus library or framework, I should say, um, that um, you know uh, lets you write applications that run in a secured part of the the processor, right? So it's mm -hmm. uh, it's running in encrypted memory. And um, the, the, the thing here is that uh, no one is able to access whatever is running inside of the, um, the encrypted part, like the, the enclave, as they call it. Mm. Um, and this could potentially be very useful for, um, for businesses that are, you know, that have really, really strict uh, regulatory compliances in place, like um, the the example that they typically give, that Microsoft typically gives, is that if you want to do something like um, uh, perform uh, an, an AI analysis on some patient data, yeah. right, and you're doing this with multiple hospitals or multiple um, technical partners, you need to ensure that you know none of that patient data gets leaked when it's being processed, and uh, confidential computing can help in, in that in that specific domain, let's say. Um, and, and, you know, when I reviewed it, again, it was only, uh, there was, I, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, because it's been a while and I've, I've done a lot of things since. So if I remember correctly, there was only um, support for the Open Enclave uh, SDK. And now you can, actually, um, you can actually make it so that your entire VM is encrypted, so that, um, you know the the security guarantees that you that you had with just running a single application that that extends to the uh, virtual machine that is running, um, and I think that that is a technology that is being used with um, AMD CPUs for the moment. I think uh, I'm not entirely sure whether it's it it's actually a thing on Intel CPUs. I don't think it is, but yeah. you know. It doesn't. It doesn't um, really, really matter as much. Um, you know, uh, on Azure, it's it's just a, a matter of selecting the right VM SKU, um, and and then you're you're good to go. Uh, so I think that that sort of that sort of technology, especially the direction that it's evolving now, uh, is going to be the next big thing. I'd say. Um, in that it's going to be commoditized as well, right? Okay. Um, because because now when you're, for instance, when you're provisioning a container, mm. right, on, on Azure, you don't really need to think all that much about setting up Linux namespaces and all that. It's just a couple of clicks mm. and you, you really don't need to worry about much. And I think that commercial computing is going to evolve into that same direction. And perhaps in a few years we'll have you know, confidential computing enabled by default on all VM SKUs, maybe, or, or something along those lines. Mm. Um, I think it's going to evolve in, in, in that direction. And again, I, I nothing is 100% secure, yeah. right? Um, but I think that this is a, a great step forward in making it so that data that's in process is actually secured as it's being processed. So. And you can also use it with containers and, mm -hmm. and uh, Kubernetes as well. So again, I think it's it's really going to be the one of the next big things. Uh, mm. So yeah, I, I can go on about that subject for a while. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds um, interesting as well. On the other hand, uh, Thomas, mm -hmm. so uh, knowing something about this confidential computing is uh, also my personal interest from your end. Okay. So yep. uh, that's why I just popped in this question for our audience mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, yep. this community of Azure on Air was uh, actually initiated to throw light on topics that experts feel in sharing with the uh, budding Azure users. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, yep. so to whomever who come in as a speaker, we just ask ask them for a quick tip they would like to give for the Azure community. So what would be your quick tip for the uh, budding users in general? Um. How do they just start off with Azure and uh, how, how can they, they start just start off with Azure? Uh, yeah. yeah. How can they just yeah, uh, so, go ahead with Azure and build things there? Yeah. So 
You know, when, when I started out with Azure, and this was, I think, in 2014, and it was still called uh, Windows Azure, right? It was the the, the service manager um, that was doing all the things. Now it's the Azure resource manager that's uh, taking care of everything. Um, there, I, um, you know, I didn't have things like MS Learn. I, I would have to use something like like uh, Plural Site to um, to really um, learn new concepts. But nowadays, um, Microsoft Learn, I think, is uh, really the go-to place mm. when you want to learn about Azure. They have such good, um, you know, um, teaching materials in there that really uh, start with basic things, right? Because you have to start with something basic and then, you know, you just expand as you go. So mm. I would typically recommend someone who's who's getting started with this to just take a look at the Microsoft Learn um, pages, perhaps the um, the Azure Fundamentals, um, the Azure Fundamentals modules. Let's say those are a really good starting off point. I'd say if you want to get started with Azure, um, and you can learn all the things as you're going, uh, right? And they also have um, a lot of cool example scenarios. Uh, GitHub is filled with um, all sorts of demo applications that yeah. you can roll out. Uh, they also, you know, they also have come typically with with uh, Azure Resource Manager templates or Bicep files that you can just, you know, typically it's a it's a one click operation. They have like the the big blue button that says Deploy to Azure. You just click it, and then everything gets filled in for you in the portal so that you can just, you know, um, roll out a specific environment, maybe tinker with a few settings. Mm. Um, and, and that's typically how I would do it. I would just, you know, roll something out, maybe tinker with it and see um, how far you can push it until it breaks. And then, you know, ah, I shouldn't have done that. And then <laughs> you just keep that in mind. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's good to hear from an expert to know what are the things that people have to look on to when they are moving into Azure. Yeah, so it was very glad hosting you in our show, uh, Thomas. So uh, we are looking forward for many more commitments with you and many more awesome. talk shows with you. Covey.co. 